Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I hope you're having a good week so far. I hope you had a good weekend, whatever you ended up doing. It's been hot here. And it's weird because it's not as hot as where I used to live in California, but it feels hotter for some reason. Or maybe it's just me. My husband says it's not that hot, but oof, I've been feeling it the last few days. At any rate, um what have you been up to? Our weekend was nice. I hung out with a friend on Friday night. Hubby went out with uh, some friends of his, so he had separate evenings, and mine was just staying in with the friend and watching movies and eating popcorn, which was the perfect amount of socialness for my weekend. And then on Sunday, we had brunch with some other friends um, for a birthday, and that was lovely. Their son is he's either four or five. He was four when I met him, and I can't remember if he's had his birthday yet or not. Um, so he's four or five, and he, he's one of those kids that likes to pretend he's a dog or a cat or whatever. And so he was under the table pretending to be a cat, and he kept bumping me and making me rub his back with my foot, <laughs> which was adorable and also a little bit weird that, you know, I was using my bare foot to rub this kid's back because, you know, feet aren't always the cleanest things in the world, but he... He and his little cat-like state was seeming to enjoy it a lot, so that made me laugh, and he's he's a sweetheart, he's a cute kid. Um, so yeah, pretty calm weekend, and now here we are into another week, and it's almost July, which is insane, but um, we're going to talk about some books. Mainly just one book, of course, but uh, we do talk about a few other books that the author writes as well, the author being Heloisa Prieto. Uh, she is a Brazilian author, and we are going to talk about her book, The Musician. Let me give you the description of that book. Tomas has felt alone most of his life. His only companions, the musical creatures that he can see but others can't. Wealth, talent, charisma, good looks, and fame conceal the 18-year-old's lingering pain following the loss of his parents. His music is his bridge to the world and his favorite form of connection. A chance meeting with a group of strangers leads to the eventual revelation of his magical musical secret, and there are those who wish to steal it from him. Soon the wealthy Dr. Alonzo and his beguiling daughter Dora trick Thomas into joining a cult from which he may never escape. When Marlui, a young Guarani shaman, senses the danger surrounding Thomas, she vows to protect him from Dr. Alonzo at all costs. Can she rescue him, or will Thomas succumb to the advances of Dora and lose not only his heart, but the powers that bring him joy? And so, again, that is The Musician, the description of The Musician, by Heloisa Prieto. And it is, there's a lot of different layers to this book, a lot of different elements. You have this young musician um, who he, who he sees music, actually. He, he sees these magical creatures, musical creatures that appeared to him after his parents' death, um, kept him company after his parents' death. And so he experiences music differently. And he's not the only one because there are a couple of little boys who also have the same experience and can relate to Tomas because of this shared experience. So there's lot, there's elements of, um, what could be magical realism or could be just a different way of seeing the world and throughout the book there's also the this connection made through the music with this group of people one day at the fountain um brings together Tomas and Marlui and the two little boys and their parents and um a coworker of one of the the boys parents and then the two um Dr. Alonzo and his daughter all of these people meet one day at a fountain because of Tomas's music and from there, 
it gets a little dark. It gets a little mysterious. There is uh, elements of Marlowe's people's beliefs, but also the the cult's beliefs, which are based on Greek mythology and the story of Orpheus. So there's a lot of different things happening in this story um, that evolve and develop throughout the story. But let's go ahead and let Heloisa talk about this book and what inspired her to write it. Again, it's called The Musician. Hello, Heloisa. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, how nice to be talking to you. Thank you for inviting me. Well, um, by Vindu, and thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about your novel, The Musician. But before we do that, if you wouldn't mind um, starting by just sharing a little bit about yourself so that my listeners can get to know you. I'm Heloisa Prieto, and I've been publishing for a long time now in Brazil. I have almost 100 books published for kids, young adult readers, you know, um, adults sometimes as well. And I, besides writing, I do constantly research. I, I've been working with indigenous people trying to, uh, how can I say, curate some books with their mythologies and uh, beliefs and things. So I've been to Amazons and several forests. I'll be traveling, you know, with one of my best friends, Daniel Munduruku. He's a leader and activist in July. So I have a very active life, you know, from speaking to readers, traveling <laughs> and writing and researching. Okay, yes. And um you live in Brazil, so that's fun because we get to read books that take places. Well, for me, I did not grow up in Brazil, so it's fun for me to read stories set in other places and written by people who actually live there. Yes, I live in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is the largest city in South America, mm-hmm. but there is an indigenous community like two hours from here uh, on the way to the, to the beach. You know, they, they live in a very beautiful tropical forest and uh, they are considered to be the strongest resistance because they live so close, you know, to consumerism and to a uh, place like Sao Paulo, which is a huge city. And they, all kids over there, they like have a double life in the sense that they go to school, um, they, they love social media, by the way, <laughs> but they still keep the same rights. They love the forest and all about it. And so this is where, uh, I constantly go. I have a godson, little boy, and over there. And so, uh, the story, the musician takes place that uh, it was in that community. It's not a fictional, I mean, it's not a, it's a fairy tale in a way, but based upon reality. That's a place I usually go and visit. It's real. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's great that you you mentioned that because that actually is a big part of the story. And one character in particular who lives in the forest but goes to school in the city, so she's balancing those two aspects of her life and trying to, you know, figure out what that means for her. Yeah, Marie, that's the character you're mentioning. She's a, a young adult, and she's has been inspired by Sulamikachi. He's She's also a writer, and she lived with us for like two years. And uh, in real life, she became an, an engineer, <laughs> but she was a shaman, you know, at the same time. So she had just uh, two realms inside of her. She was a very clever student. She could connect and have a social life. But when you you had some time free, you know, could talk to her, I could realize that another sensitivity, which was very, very special, very poetic. She was a very beautiful girl. She is, she's married now. Anyway, she's the source of inspiration for Marie. And how do these kids walk around the world now trying to keep what they call traditional knowledge, you know, with the herbs and um, knowledge of the trees and meditation, especially. They meditate daily looking at the river. And in Sao Paulo, lots of food and customs have been uh, influenced by them. You know, like acai, it's a fruit that now it's an energetic fruit. Everybody takes it. It's indigenous. So their influence is very, is huge. 
and so and I wanted but I, I realized there were nothing there was no stories, young adult tales at all published in Brazil. So I tried to pay homage to my friends and, you know, have them as characters in a novel. Yeah, and I, I think you did a great job, especially having her be a part of both worlds because then we can see it. We who might not know that as much about that culture can learn from someone who is who has traveled in both worlds. Yeah, uh, my father was... This is a family trait. When he was a little boy, he was hyperactive, and my grandmother couldn't take him in the house. You know, there was she was always upset. But she realized that when he was playing with Guarani kids, Guarani is that same nation. You know, uh, he became much nicer, and so he was the first one in the family to fall in love with Guarani culture and indigenous populations. And then, when he grew up and he became a um, civil servant. He started going up to Chavantes in Amazons and fighting for the marcation of their land. Every year he would travel like three months and go back and forth. You know. So the first time I heard about uh, indigenous people wisdom was through my father. It was not by reading a book or researching, nothing like that. He told me the stories and I, he believed they were the answer for the future. You know. They knew how to combine um, ecology, um, a nice, calm life, health in in today's world. And so I kind of inherited his mission. And when I was like uh, 39, I went to the Amazons to work with Chikonas right in the middle of the forest. And I was supposed to be their teacher because they were trying to, we were trying to curate a book with their legends and drawings. But I think it was the other way around. And I felt just like my father, and I was just obsessed with their kindness and beauty. And so when I came back, um, my publisher from Penguin invited me to curate a book by Daniel Munduruku, who is now a, a very famous activist. And so the first book ever written by an indigenous author was my curation. I'm very proud of that. And we became very close friends. It's been 30 years now. And so we wrote books together, we travel together, we go back and forth. And because of uh, Daniel, I also, this is, he's the one who introduced me to Sulemi and several other uh, nations and people. So I'm still very involved with uh, their fight. <clears throat> yeah, that's wonderful. And, and we do see some of that in this book. It is actually time for our first break of this episode. When we come back, we'll we be getting to the overview of the story as a whole. We've talked about Marlowe, but uh, when we come back, an overview of the story as a whole. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Heloisa Prietu about her book, The Musician. Let's return to that interview. So we've talked a little bit about Marlui and her character, but can you give an overview of the story as a whole? The story um, shows Thomas. Thomas is a young, very well successful musician. Very, He's famous and he's wealthy and he comes from a rich family in Brazil, so he lives in a huge house, but he has lost, he was an only son and he lost his parents. So he has a sense of isolation and lack of connection. At the same time, when his loss happened, when he was little, he started connecting with music and music put him through pain. 
but his connection is very special because he can see music, you know, as beings, musical beings. He talks to them all the time, you know, and he, he realizes he cannot share that with anyone. So at the same time, he's very rich and handsome and girls all over, you know, like a traditional rock star, but he's isolated because he doesn't really share what he sees. So he likes playing busking, you know, once in a while, even though he's very famous. He he goes to some squares, sometimes downtown, and plays for free. And this is how the story starts. And he's, he's there, he goes to a specific square, which is also a place that exists near uh, law law school, and he starts playing. And so people gather to see him. And he is seen by all his audience. This is why I, I try to introduce several points of view at that moment, because there are several people watching him play. And each one of them came there for a certain reason, but they were all connected, like in a synchronicity um, move. You know, they, they were attracted to that point. It was not by chance. And each one of them sees him in a certain way, different ways. And Marlou is there, and she can re- she looks at him, and she knows he can see all the creature. He sees music, and the way he sees music is the way her community sees music. But he doesn't know that yet. <clears throat> and what was your initial inspiration for the story? Well, many things. Uh, first of all, of course, there's some. When I started uh, talking to shamans in the Guarani community, I uh, I still talk to them almost every day. You know, there was just very young shaman. He came to me and he said, "You belong to the forest. That's why sometimes you feel sad when you are in town. You are a Guarani storyteller. You're not a writer. You know? The forest chooses some souls." It's not the other way around. I thought that was very interesting. I thought, I told, I asked him, do, don't I have to be indigenous? You know, it's not a blood thing. He said, not at all. You know, people, there are some boys here, girls, they want to be in town. They want to go to malls. You know, it's a state of mind. And then, uh, from talking to them, I learned so much about storytelling, um, the meaning of storytelling, the importance of narrative and changes. You know, it was an initiation for, Several years, I would go there every single weekend and learn. So, <clears throat> um, of course, I I shift to music because I took a friend of mine, a Russian guitar player. He's very skilled, Stas Tone. Uh, he's very successful, and he came to Brazil. And I invited him to meet the shaman and learn something about sound healing. And this is what he's been doing now, you know, sound healing. And he really, really loved the experience. So Thomas has a bit of Estas as well in his ability to mesmerize people with his guitar. And there is a chapter in which there's a surprise, you know, a magical surprise happens to Thomas, which is based upon uh, Five Strings is the name. It's something that really happened to Estas when he was, you know, being introduced to the sound healing by the shaman himself. In real life. Oh, interesting. That's that's really interesting. Um, when it comes to Tomas uh, as a main character, although we get other characters' points of view, what about him do you think is going to resonate with readers? His loneliness, I think, his isolation, because I think young adult readers, especially when they're artistic and gifted, with the words they have to pandemic times, everyone feels a bit cut off, you know, needs to reconnect with uh, themselves, with roots, with community. So his inability, you know, he's very seductive, but at the same time, he's very lonely. And also he's naive, you know, and all of us are naive, are always naive, I think. So in a certain, uh, the first half of the story is quite gothic, you know, it's very heavily written in the sense of uh, darkness. Because Thomas doesn't really follow his impulses. Well, this is a spoiler, but he he goes along uh, some very wealthy people and he gets into a cult. And I think every one of us is could somehow 
do that, you know, be seduced to um, a path doesn't really belong to us. Just as everyday life in contemporary world, you know, we have to choose all the time. And sometimes we don't choose well. So this is a vulnerability in Thomas, I think, that can really help uh, the readers to love him. And people do, you know, I've got excellent reviews, um, good reads all over, you know, uh, people saying they identify with him, with his mistakes as well. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And one thing I find very interesting about Tomas is his his ability to see the the to see music and the way he interacts with them and there are a couple of other characters who can it as well and so some people would read that and think it's magic and some people would read that and think that he was slightly crazy and some people would think that that's just science that we don't understand yet and that's one th- I think he's a really good in- um example of how we see the world and things that we don't always understand because especially gifted people like Tomas who interact with the world differently. We don't fully understand how their brains work yet. Exactly. You see, there is a sentence in which I'm very happy with. I, I heard it myself. You know, it was not um, when the shaman tells him there is no supernatural. Everything is natural. So for indigenous people in Brazil, the, there is no separation between wonder and reality like we do. You know, everything is wonderful in a way. They have this appreciation for difference, uh, individuality, uh, one's way of seizing the world. This is really, mess- I, I, I always love that about them. And so he wouldn't be considered uh, weird, like my father was not being hyperactive as a child. When he went to Guarani, he, he was okay. That was the way he is. I mean, he was just somebody who couldn't stand still. And uh, I was a writer, and I felt lonely sometimes because I had to connect with people who were storytellers. You see, there is this way of, uh, very cozy way of accepting our differences. People don't put labels on you. At least I've never met them. Uh, over 30 years of going and meeting people from indigenous uh, communities and nations, I always see this tolerance and understanding about idiocra- uh, typical sensibilities, you know, atypical, which we, we call uh, neurodiverse, but they mm-hmm. don't really, they just say, that's the way he is, you know, he's entitled, yeah. we're entitled we- to be who we are. This is a, actually a really beautiful way of looking at people. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of the story is told from Tomas's perspective, but there are other characters in the book and you talk, you, you use their perspectives of, as well. So can you talk about writing from those multiple points of view and why you chose to do that? Because I, uh, you see, I want to break and create a new narrative. Usually <clears throat> books written about, uh, uh, native, let's say, original people in Brazil, they have poly- uh, politics and struggles and loss, you know, and death. And I wanted to show their beauty very much. And so I chose several different characters because I wanted to see if everyone can see their beauty, you know. Their, their wisdom, even if you don't believe in it, like Vera is skeptical, a lawyer. In the beginning, she doesn't understand anything, but then she starts respecting, you know, the way they see the world. Uh, Gabriela is based upon a real character. She's one of my friends and she's a true, she's, uh, a story, uh, I mean, um, <clears throat> she writes scripts professionally. And in fact, she wants to turn, uh, the musician into a movie sometime. And so uh, this is very much like the way she feels and acts. You know, she's always hunting stories. She has two little kids and she's there working with the kids, just loving husband, but she's always focusing on the stories as well. And so I wanted to have somebody who's connected to image streaming series to make comments on the story because that would help. Like... Uh, if I could translate 
their beauty into several points of view. You know, that's what I try to do. Because if you just come up and say, oh, this beautiful nation is dying, but you don't really have people uh, connecting to their beauty. People close the book. Say, well, this is not my problem. What a shame, you know. And I want them to feel sorry for them in the sense that we should preserve that. This is beautiful. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. There is the, um, the perspective of Marlouis and her, her beliefs and her culture, but then there's also a, a larger storyline that involves Tomas and the cult that he becomes involved in that involves Greek mythology. So, um, what about that story of Orpheus made you want to bring it into Tomas's story? I've been uh, researching, I've written three books of uh, uh, Greek myths, you know, for your middle middle grade kids, you know, so I've always researched it. Um, And then, but then when I started speaking to indigenous people, I realized I took them as Bible in the sense that they were the perfect myths in the beginning. And then uh, once we had a conversation about stories and they asked, why semi-gods why not be human and I realized there was so much so many power plays all the time and uh, indigenous people when you you get their stories it's more about connecting with nature losing connection connectivity with nature there you don't see power plays like you see in Greek mythology and Orpheus I was thinking about him it struck me that he was killed by his fans, you know, the ladies who were in love with him in the myth. They cut his head out because he cannot love them back. And I thought about Kurt Cobain, you know, Jimi Hendrix, everybody, uh, young uh, rock stars who have died from overwork, you know, from being exhausted, disrespected. And I made a connection with Orpheus. I thought, well, this is from the beginning of time. Now, when I was in Chikunas, everybody drew, everybody sung, and there was nothing. Everybody was an author in a way, you know. So uh, the place of an artist in indigenous communities is the place of everyone. Everyone can create. Now, in our capitalist society, consumerist, I mean, if you are an artist, you have to sell. You you almost you can become a product very easily, and so this is why I wanted to put you know in the beginning, he's there in the cult, he's being consumed by the cult, and then he realizes he has to leave. You know. <clears throat> okay, yes, thank you for that. It is now time for our second break of this episode, but I will say as we're going to break that I really love the passion that Heloisa brings to her stories and the thought and reasons behind, behind those stories and the passion. You can just, you can hear it as she talks about it. So I greatly appreciate that. When we come back, we'll be talking about some of the research that went into this story. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC book review podcast and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Heloisa Prietu. 
And you mentioned at the beginning that you love to do research. You do a lot of research. And I can imagine that there was quite a lot of research that went into this story. Can you talk a little bit about some of that that research that you did? Yes. Uh, I was both reading, you know, uh, Greek mythology, but I was also going to the to, uh, I was going to Guarani community all the time and, you know, taking afternoons like today. Usually I, I, I go on Saturdays and listen because they're not, it's not a, now they're beginning to write books, you know, they have been doing that for 20 years, but still, uh, the oral communication, the voice is very, very important because they believe the voice has a magical quality. And the same mythology for Guaranese is told over and over, but new details are added depending on, uh, your place in life. So if you are going, if you are coming of age, there will be a right and the shaman will come to you and he will tell new details of the same fairy tale you heard as a child. And I was very, very interested in that, uh, concept of adding new layers to the stories. And so my research was going there, talking and listening. But of course, uh, I have a PhD on cultural memory and I also research very much canons, why some stories are chosen over other stories. What happens, you know, that a certain community chooses and excludes some stories and others stay. Sometimes you see like best-selling stories very famous for a while, and then everybody forgets them. And one single story, nobody was paying attention back in the day, and it stays forever. So this is something I also research, you know, out of curiosity, and also because I'm a writer, and I need to know a little bit, I think, about this um, mechanism, let's say, <clears throat> dynamics. Sure. And then how about your characters? So obviously you do research and you find, you figure out all the things that you need to know to craft the story. But what about your characters? Do you have a really good understanding of them before you start writing? Or do you prefer to let them develop kind of on their own as you write or somewhere in the middle? Well, I went, I worked as a script writer for a while and I remember every single character had, uh, when we wrote the characters about, we had to do, what will he overcome, you know, uh, what will the character learn? But this is not how, how I wrote, I work in literature. I usually choose characters that, that have more than one horizon side of them. Bilingual characters like Guarani, Marlui, she speaks Guarani and Portuguese, two languages, you know, at the same time. So I'm interested in people who have a very inner, a huge inner place, but they don't know how to place it in the world. So Tomás is like that as well, you know. How can he uh, use his knowledge without being consumed by his his fans, you know, his listeners? And so this is something I usually do, you know, trying to find connection and connection with a certain community. This is all my stories deal upon uh, traditional values such as loyalty, truth, um, love, friendship. You know, I'm very traditional in this sense. So even though my writing is has some new techniques, let's say, uh, I'm always looking for truth in life. And so characters, when I start writing about them, I usually know all about them. What I have to think is, how would they be in the world? Not the inner world, but outside world. How would they react? And that comes up. For instance, uh, there is a dialogue in which Marie says she criticizes Eurydice in Orpheus. She says, ah, she's so, uh, she's such a little girl. Why doesn't she fight like a warrior? Why doesn't she follow up, you know, on her lover? And this came up while I was, I was writing. I didn't plan on it. The character spoke, <laughs> told me. I have heard more than one author say that, that the characters sometimes come up with their own ideas. Yeah. Yes. Um, are you working on a new book now? Yes. It's, uh, cause I have my uh, production in Portuguese, you know, 
And usually uh, my last book was for uh, middle graders and I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I have translated it to English. It's about an artistic character. Again, you know, you have a very specific kind of sensibility. But what I'm writing now, researching, is a book that I'm writing in English again, and it's called uh, Storyteller. And it speaks about a boy who comes from Nigeria to Brazil. There are many Nigerians in Brazil, you know, and there's this cultural shock sometimes because Brazil has lots of races. And unfortunately, it's terrible at the moment, you know. And they are very sophisticated people sometimes, you know, come from wealthy families, speak several languages, and go into the mall, and they are not well treated, for instance. But the main character are two brothers, brother and sister. It's a story of a brother who finds his sister and how their interaction will change both their lives. And the storyteller is the girl. And the boy is the one who teaches her about Ifa. Ifa is the storytelling tradition from Nigeria, which is wonderful. So she was a a professional storyteller, you know, 19 years old, telling stories to kids in parties. And she finds out she has a half-brother she doesn't know about. And he comes from Nigeria. When they get together, they get very strong you know, in this exchange. Uh, I wanted to write about brotherhood. I haven't seen that. So I thought it would be nice to do that. Thank you for sharing that. What about middle grade and young adult? What about that age group do you think um, draws you to write in that genre? Yeah, I used to write for small kids when my kids were little. But then uh, I started writing adventures, especially ghost stories for middle graders. And it, they ask for more and more and write me and they want. So I, I ended up being invited to write stories for young adult and middle grade readers. It's nothing uh, I looked for. I mean... People ask me for stories. This is something in my life you know, all the time. For instance, I was giving a lecture about uh, Celtic mythology. And then one boy raises his arm and he says, why don't you write about São Paulo's most famous ghost, the blonde in the bathroom? <laughs> and he gave me the story. And I thought it was interesting. So I, I wrote the blonde ghost in the bathroom. And it was really controversial. It, became a bestseller, then people wanted me to write more more about ghosts. Ghosts have to do with middle grade mainly, right? And then uh, finally, um, I'm, once I was driving and um, in Indy Avenue, and this little boy, he knocked on my window and he said, close your window now, this is dangerous. And I did, and he was a robber in fact. And they robbed every single one, you know, in the line. And I was very touched because he wanted to protect me. I never knew why. So I started going back to see if I could find him. I couldn't. He was probably an addict. And so from that moment on, which was 1997, I started working with uh, deprived kids, you know, um, making workshops, storytelling, and telling their stories as well. You know. So it came up like this. You know, I was moved by that experience, and I wanted him to live. His name, I thought, you know, invented the name for him would, would be Sebastian. And that book I wrote was called The Ballad, won many prizes, and then again, invitations came and came to write more for young adults, but also showing it, kids who are uh, excluded you know, from middle class life. And mm-hmm. at the same time, they were very um, wealthy inside themselves. I mean, they were very courageous and brave. And so I see that in Sao Paulo all the time. Like sometimes I go in the morning to a public school and kids are dancing and meditating and learning English and very excited about learning. And then on the same day, I go to a very elite school and kids are bored and scrolling on their mobile. You know, it's a weird moment in Brazil, you know, social clash. And uh, I wanted to write about kids 
in public schools, the private suburbs, young adults who are coming of age, how do they act? So, you know, to help visibility as well. Well, it sounds like you've had some really good points in your life where you've been given direction and you've followed yeah. those directions. And, and, exactly. And... That's it. Perfect. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And when did you start writing? Is it something that you've always wanted to do or did you, how did you come to decide to write for publication? No, I was, <laughs> my, my, my family, my mother's family had farms and I love animals. So I always thought I would grow cows or something and live in the country, you know. But I lived in the country as a child and uh, people were great storytellers. And singers, you know, so I learned about storytelling very early. It's very easy for me to make up a story very quickly. And, uh, my mother was a great storyteller as well, because people from Bahia tell stories all the time, especially horror stories. And then, uh, when I got into school, I learned about the Bible stories and I was fascinated by them. And I could, uh, retell them very easily. So my teacher used to put me in front of class, you know, reading my retellings of the Bible stories. And I loved it. And when I was 16 years old, it, there was this dictatorship in Brazil. We couldn't really learn literature, so my mother sent me to the States, Michigan, Constantine High School. And this is where I learned poetry for the first time. So I was introduced to high literature, I mean, you know, so in English first. And I, re- uh, I read Carl Sandsburg, you know, uh, David, uh, Fra- Robert Frost, Emily Dickinson, before I even learned, uh, Brazilian poets and writers. And we had this workshop, which was amazing. Every day, I had great teachers at the time. And, uh, I could write stories very easily again, as soon as I could write in English. And I wrote the first story was about a magical bird coming from Brazil to the States. And uh, everybody in the class, my teacher loved so much. She asked me if I had help to write it. You know, that was such a compliment for me at the time. But then when I came back to Brazil, I thought I should be a translator. I didn't feel confident enough to show my stories or publish them. So for several years, I worked with classics, like translating Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, Jack London. And then uh, one day, my my publisher from Penguin, Lilia Schwax, she saw a story of mine and she says, why don't you publish, you know, a story, that story you wrote about a kid and an elf coming from the video game. And I did. And the story was very well, you know, it sold like 2,000 copies in a weekend. <laughs> it was a phenomenon. And then I never stopped writing. Now it's 95 books published. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and again, it sounds like you had some very good direction given to you. Exactly. It's like calling, you know, people. Yes. Ask, Why don't you write? Please tell me that. Tell me that. I want to know again, you know, I'm not like the regular. I have many friends who dreamt about being uh, writers, you know, but that's not the way it happened to me. And even with the musician, I have a, uh, a writer's group in, in Ireland because my oldest daughter was living in Ireland for a while. Now she's living in the States. And, uh, I, we went there, my, my youngest daughter and I to meet her, to see her. And we saw this, uh, writing group and we joined them. And I've been working with them for several years now. And one of the members of the Inkies is Greg Fields, a wonderful, U.S. writer, you know, he's amazing. And he's also an editor at Colors. And so when he saw some pieces from, you know, the musician, he says, give me the story I'll publish for you in the U.S. You know, so again, you know, I give him the story. And so Kohler really, you know, did a great job and the book looks beautiful with wonderful cover and things. Now it's being, uh, it, the rights are being negotiated from Brazil. But again, it was an invitation. Someone who called me and says, you should publish that. Publish in English. You don't have to translate it first. 
And time for our final break of this episode. When we come back, Heloisa will be talking about some advice that she might give for aspiring authors or to aspiring authors. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Heloisa Prietu. From your experience then and all, all of the wonderful people that you've interacted with on your writing path, do you have advice for someone who thinks they might want to write someday? I think you should believe in your own story because, of course, I'm telling you the successful <laughs> Uh, meetings, but there were times when people did not understand stories I, I wanted to publish, you know, later on, uh, after I was, they wanted me to do always the same type of story because I was so sex, 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 successful so early in life. And so people, why don't you write the same thing again, again and again? And I refused, especially when I wanted to write about poor kids, you know, the private kids from uh, peripheral districts in Brazil, it was hard to find a publisher. But don't give up. You you write with your heart. And do even if the story takes a little bit longer, you know, to be accepted or to find the best house, the best uh, literary partner. Be true to yourself. Don't go for trends or opinions so easily, you know. You have to be faithful to your view, mainly. That's what I think. Okay, thank you. How about um, your reading preferences? When you take time to read just for you, who are your favorite authors and your favorite genres? Well, I read all the time, you know. Uh, I've been reading lots of uh, new young adult or uh, I like Sada Bohm, for instance. She's an Irish writer. Very young one, and uh, amazing books, you know, of, um, a bit like um, Virginia Woolf in the sense that it's in a monologue, and I like that very much. I also like uh, classics like uh, Bram Stoker. I keep on going back to Dracula. I think it's a masterpiece. It's wonderful, you know. I like reading back and forth. Proust, you know. Searching the Lost Time is a huge influence in my work. I always go back and read him. And poets, North American poets, very much. Emily Dickinson is one of my favorites. I like Silver Plath as well. Once I was reading her diaries, couldn't stop reading them over and over. So many influences. And in Brazil, uh, I have several friends I admire. But in terms of uh, international, internationally known, I like Paulo Coelho very much you know, and his magical way of seeing everyday life. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. If people want to know more about your books or you, um, can you tell them where they can find you if you have a website or if you're available on any social media? Yes, I'm available all over, you know, social media. I have a, a website, com, And also I made a page for the musician only for... Anglo-Saxon readers, it's all in English. It's uh, the musician.info, Eloisa Prieto, yeah. only for the book, because my uh, website is bilingual, Portuguese and English, but not all books are available in English. I'm just beginning to to get into this uh, Anglo-Saxon world now. You know. So um, you could choose 
you can talk to me on social media and you can also see my website. Now I would, uh, there is the group in Ireland I work with, Inkies, is Inkies dot IE, Ireland, you know. And they usually publish some new stories I've been just, you know, trying to experiment with. There's this section where they pu- keep on publishing uh, new fragments and uh, short stories by their members. And I have several short stories there in English because I haven't been able to translate all my previous work so far. I'm really focusing now on this. Uh, writing English to me has been meeting again uh, with the girl when I was 16 years old. And with that sensibility, in a way, you know, it's different when you're writing English and writing Portuguese. And I'm really fascinated by writing English again. You know, it's like coming home in a way. Yes, I can only imagine um, writing in different languages and how that would, because your brain thinks differently in different languages, so how that might change your story and how you go about crafting the story. Exactly, yes. Well, Heloisa, we've talked about a variety of different things, but is there <laughs> anything that we haven't covered that you were hoping to make sure you highlighted during our time together? Yes, yes. I'm so gl- grateful. Thank you. Uh, lovely to talk to you. I'm very happy. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I really, really appreciate it. Muito obrigada. <laughs> obrigada. Thank you. <laughs> lovely. <laughs> Thank you again to Heloisa for joining me. And, you know, I always share with you that something always seems to go weird with interviews and scheduling for me. And this was no different. We actually had our interview and it was just fine. But for some reason, Heloisa got an an email that said that the interview had been canceled. I have no idea where that email came from. I have not figured that out yet. She sent me an email asking about it. I did not get that email (laughs) until about five minutes before we were set to interview as I was replying to it saying, no, no, we're fine. Uh, she had logged into the, the, the interview link and we had, it was just fine, but the world is a mystery folks. That's all I can say. Um, this is a book about magical elements and uh, there's some weird magic in the world sometimes, but everything worked out and I am grateful. So thank you to Heloisa for logging in and joining me to talk about the musician. If you are a fan of myths and mythology and other cultures and beliefs, and maybe you've been to Brazil and you want to learn more about um, Marlowe's people and their beliefs, or maybe you're interested in Greek mythology and you want to see a slightly different spin on the Orpheus story, or maybe you've never been to Brazil and you want like learning about other cultures, then this might be a book that you would like to check out or for someone that you love. Um, who loves to read books of this sort, definitely check out this book and um, any of other Heloise's books that have been translated into English. Um, thank you again for joining me. I hope you'll join me for the next episode. I'll be speaking with author Philip Fracassi. I'm going to have to get the, sp- the pronunciation of his last name correct when I talk to him. We're going back to the world of suspense horror um, with his book The Boys in the Valley. So join me for that conversation and um, we'll see how spooky this one is <laughs> with my, my sense of wimpiness. Um, you know, I'll let you know. At any rate, hope you're having a great week. If you are a fan of this podcast, as always, uh, you can leave a review. That will get the podcast out to more people. You can do that by leaving a written review, a star review, however it works on the platform you, you listen on. Also on that platform, make sure you're following the podcast so that you always know when there are new episodes. And then finally, you can follow the podcast on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Love hearing from you and love to know what you're up to these days. Thank you so much. Again, I hope you're having a great week. Hope you have something fun planned. But as always, I hope your week affords plenty of time for you to find yourself getting lost in some really good books. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www 
gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program. Thank you.